Hello, Archie Dunlop here with Talking Astrology with Archie. In this video, I want to look at the week starting on Monday, May the 27th, 2024. And this week runs through until Sunday, June the 2nd, 2024. Now, to give you an idea about the structure of this video, I'm going to begin by looking at the week's main events from an astrological perspective. For example, on Tuesday, there's a quintile between Jupiter and Saturn. On Friday, there is a conjunction between Mercury and Uranus. Then I want to focus on one of those aspects, which is the conjunction between Mercury and Uranus, and consider how it might impact one person and um, a couple of things. That one person is Donald Trump. A couple of things are uh, the marriage between Harry and Meghan and also the Kirsch Bridge, which is a bridge linking Crimea with the R Russia, the Russian mainland. Having done that, I want to discuss quite briefly my concerns in a nuclear sense. Uh, there are echoes this summer with the first nuclear explosion on June 16th, 1945. You know, I don't want to scare anyone. I just uh, want to point out my observations. And having done that, I'm going to do an I Ching for the week. So I'm going to do an I Ching and I'm going to ask you know, what is this week going to be like for those watching the I Ching section of this video. And that's a reminder that this I Ching reading is not compulsory. If you don't want your I Ching done, you can stop read, you can stop watching the video when I come on to the I Ching section because my forecast, my I Ching forecast is only for those watching the forecast. If you don't watch your forecast, uh, you are not part of it. Okay, so let's start off by looking at what's going on this week astrologically. And this is a chart for the very beginning of a week. Midnight, Monday, May the 27th, 2024, set for New York. And we can see the week starts with the moon in Capricorn and sun in is in Gemini and Jupiter is in Gemini. So we might notice in general that this week is different. We've had Jupiter in Taurus for a very long time, for over a year, and now Jupiter is in Gemini. It, it may be that there is going to be more action, more energy, perhaps more variety. I mean, we're starting to get a build-up in Gemini. Notice that we've now got the Sun in Gemini, we've got the Venus, Venus in Gemini, and we've got Jupiter in Gemini. And Mercury at 16 Taurus will eventually move into Gemini. Not this week, but soon enough it will get there. And so we will get a build up um, in Gemini and in a few weeks' time, we'll, I suppose we'll have the super build-up when we have Sun, Venus, Jupiter, Mercury and the Moon in Gemini. So that build-up is starting. Now, possibly the main aspect this week from a sort of broad global level is a quintile between Jupiter and Saturn. And this quintile... Um, takes place on Tuesday. So that will be when Jupiter and Saturn are exactly 72 degrees apart. Now, 72 degrees apart is one-fifth of the circle. And this quintile represents a key stage in the Jupiter-Saturn cycle. So we had a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in 2020. And so following that conjunction, Jupiter has moved away from Saturn and, the, and it's formed different aspects. So, for example, there was a sextile between Jupiter and Saturn. And 
this summer there's actually going to be a square between Jupiter and Saturn. And the quintile, 72 degrees apart, is sort of halfway between the sextile and the square. And we have we did have it a bit last year, and this quintile between Jupiter and Saturn, but there was retrograde motion. So we're getting it again, Jupiter, Jupiter quintile Saturn. And it's quite subtle. And it should be, if you look at past cycles, quite creative. Um, it's a time where things change. We could see a changing of the guard where one regime ends, uh, another regime starts. So there was a quintile between Jupiter and Saturn um, at the end of April 1945 when um, Hitler committed suicide. Um, there was a quintile between Jupiter and Saturn um, beginning of May 1905. Now, later in May, May 1905, there was the Battle of Shushima, where the Japanese defeated the, the Russians. And there were things going on. Uh, there was actually stuff going on in Poland in, in, at the time of the quintile in 1905. I think the Russian army um, put down some insurrection in Poland and that wasn't very pleasant. But still, it's the idea that something is changing. And in many respects, this, in the past, it, it has been creative. We can, you know, we can think of the early 60s when there was a Jupiter-Saturn quintile. But I think right now with this Jupiter-Saturn quintile, I think people are thinking cr creatively but they're kind of wondering, can it happen? Is this the right place for it to happen? And I think there is probably going to be a certain feeling of unrest with this quintile between Jupiter and Saturn, because quintiles are about vision. And what we want to create, we have an idea in our heads about what we, what we want to happen out there. And you know, we very often can make it happen out there. But what happens if we can't make it happen out there? What happens if we're in a rigid society? And so I think that this Jupiter-Saturn Jupiter, Jupiter -Saturn quintile could actually be quite tense. We know that something's wrong. We know that something needs to change. But we feel we can't change it. And I suppose if you look at the UK, uh, we've got an election coming up seems to be a change, but many will feel that there's no difference between Labour and Conservative, that nothing changes. I suppose you've got similar feelings in the US when people consider the difference between the Republican and the Democrat parties. So I think that is how we might feel the Jupiter quintile Saturn. Then on Wednesday, we have got Venus semi-square Mars. I think that is an important aspect. Venus is the aspect, Venus is the planet of female sexuality. Mars is the planet of male sexuality. It's about how people get on, how people relate to each other, um, the struggle for union, but also the struggle for separateness. So that could be one aspect of Venus square Mars. It can be about sexual attraction and charisma, but it can also be about repugnance, finding that someone is not attractive. And I'm not just talking about relationships, I'm also talking about politics, people trying to be charismatic, trying to get their presence felt. And But in the process, we realise that we can't please everyone. Some people do find us repulsive, perhaps. And we might see that on a local level, um, in terms of our day-to-day -day life. Some people find us attractive, some people find us not attractive. That's the way it goes. And I suppose it can happen with politics. Uh, Donald Trump, some people really like Donald Trump. They go to his rally at the Bronx and think he's great. Other, th other people think he's repulsive. And we're going to see that repeated everywhere. Then on Friday, that's Friday, May the 31st, we have got a conjunction between Mercury and Uranus. And I think that that conjunction is 
quite important. It's about bold messages, really trying to express ourselves, um, tell the world who we are, what we've got to offer, and really wanting to be heard, really badly wanting to be heard with that Mercury conjunct Uranus. And it does create a certain amount of tension. And that tension with Mercury conjunct Uranus may actually feed into the quintile between Jupiter and Saturn. You know, something just has to give. And if it doesn't give, it will break. And I suppose June the 1st, we sort of get a similar picture because we got Mars semi-sextile Uranus. So Mars and Uranus are going to be um, exactly 30 degrees apart. So you can see at the beginning of a week, Mars is at 20 Aries, Uranus is at 23, 24 Taurus. So by midweek, but sorry, by the end of a week, Mars has moved on and is semi-sextile Uranus. And that is more about tension. Mars is how we assert ourselves. Mars in Aries. Uranus is perhaps all the things that might be holding us back. But at the same time, the whole reason why we want to make um, a big splash. And so some people may feel that in order to get attention, they have to do something dramatic. Although... Mars semi-sextile Uranus could also just be about being too hasty, being in too much of a hurry. And if we're in too much of a, tr of a hurry, well, there could be accidents. So we do have to be a little bit careful with that Mars semi-sextile Uranus. Now, looking at what's going on over the week, I did want to focus on just one aspect which was the conjunction between Mercury and Uranus. So you can see this conjunction takes place on Friday, uh, May the 31st, 2024, London time. Okay, it will happen late in the evening on Thursday if you're in California, uh, the West Coast. And there's that, con there's that conjunction. Uh, Mercury note is moving towards Algol, the the fixed star, you know, which is you know connected with Medusa's head, um, Perseus holding aloft the Gorgon's head, and it's a potentially quite evil influence. Mercury's not there yet, but I suppose um, over the weekend, as you, as we move into June, Mercury will be moving on to Algol, and. That could cause a few problems. There could be people having dark thoughts, people thinking about how bad things are, and maybe quite mean thoughts over the weekend. Um, but uh, I'll be discussing that nearer the time. But I think the key thing is you've got Mercury conjunct Uranus, and it will affect certain people, I think, one person who I think that this Mercury-Uranus conjunction could have an impact on is Donald Trump. So here's Donald Trump's horoscope. So you notice that Donald Trump has his midheaven at 24-22 Taurus. So if we uh, put the two charts side by side or one on top of the other. So there's uh, Donald Trump's midheaven, 24-22 Taurus. So that Mercury-Uranus conjunction is right on Donald Trump's midheaven. Now, we've already seen his uh, rally in, in, in the Bronx. Uh, from what I've read, it was quite a successful rally. Of course, you know, the mainstream media has liked to have, have underplayed it and said that, you know, not many people turned up. Um, the organisers said it was 25,000. I think the police said it was 10,000 or something like that. And that's always the case when people have rallies, isn't it? The organisers say one figure and the police always come up with a figure which is much lower. I certainly remember that when I, <laughs> many decades ago when I went on to CND, when went on CND marches. But he's already got Uranus on the midheaven. He's already getting a getting attention. He's taking advantage of the fact he has to be in New York by going to rallies. And so with Mercury conjunct Uranus, 
I think he'll be able to use that quite constructively. I think he'll be able to really push himself out into the limelight even more than he has already. So, as always, we're going to hear a lot more about Donald. But perhaps he needs to be a little bit careful what he says, because Mercury Uranus is is hasty. Um, we just say say something without really thinking about it. So that's that's Trump. I do think the Mercury Uranus conjunction might have an impact on him. Then there is Harry and Meghan's wedding. So this is the wedding chart for May the nineteenth, twenty eighteen. Um, I've got twelve thirty nine p.m. and their midheaven was actually very similar t- to Donald Trump's midheaven. So the Mercury Uranus conjunction is hitting the midheaven of the marriage. I suppose the midheaven in a marriage is where the marriage is going to, and I suppose in most marriages the midheaven is a bit hard to visualize you know it's it's a wedding, two people coming together but Do people, when they get married, really think about the ambition behind the marriage? Of course, with Harry and Meghan, we really can think about the midheaven because as a couple, they are obsessed with making money. Uh, They are obsessed with their status. It's almost like a business. It, It doesn't really matter so much whether or not they're in love with each other or anything like that. Uh, They have a joint ambition. And with Mercury conjunct Uranus on the midheaven, I think that's going to have a big impact on their joint ambition and and how they perceive their marriage and where they are going. And I think we actually can see it in a sort of career sense. Mercury conjunct Uranus may not actually be so bad. It might be that Harry and Meghan have some new ideas, something new direction that they want to take their wedding, to take their marriage. So that is a distinct possibility. Though there could be a shock. They might be working on something that they think it's working okay, but it's not working okay. And they have to make some dramatic changes in order to deal with changing circumstances. Are we going to actually ever know how that Mercury conjunct Uranus is on their midheaven is going to manifest? I don't know. Uh, It could be a private realisation. On the other hand, Mercury conjunct Uranus is very public because it's on them on the midheaven of their wedding. And so, you know, around the end of the week... uh, as Mercury makes the exact conjunct Uranus, we we may be hearing something of them and their plans, whether or not their plans are working. Maybe they'll hit a disaster. Maybe they'll hit an opportunity. So it does kind of depend on the situation and what they're actually doing. Finally, I want to mention the Kirsch Bridge. The Kirsch Bridge is the bridge between uh, Crimea and the mainland of Russia. It's not being used for military purposes anymore, But nonetheless, the Ukrainians seem to be very keen to destroy this bridge, even though it's just become civilian infrastructure. So this is a chart, May the 15th, 2018, for when I believe it was opened, when Vladimir Putin opened the bridge. And we notice that the sun is at 24 degrees, 29 Taurus. In fact, it was opened on a new moon. And given the fact that the Ukrainians have been very active in terms of firing attack and missiles at, at Crimea. And you have got Uranus on the sun and Mercury on the sun. I would have said that those re- responsible for the security of the Kirsch Bridge uh, need to be very careful. It, there is extra vulnerability here. And so there might be news about the Kirsch Bridge um, sometime this week, uh, certainly attempts to destroy it, I think. I think that's, that is very likely with, um, Merc- with this Mercury conjunct Uranus hitting the sun of the Kirsch Bridge. And that's really all I want to say about the conjunction between 
Mercury and Uranus. And I now want to consider my nuclear worries. So my nuclear worries uh, started when actually when I was looking at the horoscope of the first Indian test. So I was doing that, oh, I don't know, about a week or two ago, a week ago. I did a an analysis of the chart of India's first nuclear um, explosion, which was on May the 18th, 1974. So it was 50 years ago. And so here's a chart, the smiling Buddha. And smiling Buddha, that's what they called it, this, this explosion in the Rajasthani desert in India. And what struck me about this chart for India's first nuclear test was the position of the sun. The sun was at 26 degrees 47 minutes Taurus. Now, in, that means that the sun was on Algol. I've just talked about Algol. Algol is the head of the demon. Ras al Ghul. That's what that's what it means in Arabic. Uh, uh, that that's what, well, Ras al Ghul is what the Arabs call the head of the demon because it literally means head of the demon. Ras al Ghul, the English word Ghul, I think, comes from the Arabic. And okay, that kind of fits, doesn't it? Head of the demon, sun on the head of the demon. Um, India's first nuclear test. Then I was thinking, well, when was the first nuclear explosion? The first nuclear explosion was on June the 16th, um, 1945, uh, in the uh, New Mexico desert. And there we have Mars at 2513 Taurus. So 2513 Taurus means that Mars was on our goal. So that means that if you look at it from a transit perspective, when India exploded its first nuclear weapon, the sun was transiting Mars of that first nuclear um, explosion. So that first nuclear explosion, we can perhaps regard that as the horoscope of nuclear weapons in general. And so we might think that when um when there's a when there is you know a transit to that chart you know we can perhaps expect things to happen so we can look at this chart in terms of solar returns maybe so i thought okay so let's look at the solar return of this chart set for this year so we're going to look at the solar return of the first atomic bomb. I remember July the 16th, 1945, was uh, when this explosion happened. So I'm not talking about anything that happened that's going to be happening this week or next week. I'm talking about mid-July and the year following J July, July the 16th. So let's just look at the solar return just for fun. Okay. This is the solar return on July the 15th, 2024, when the sun returns to the position it was at the time of that first nuclear test. And look at Mars and look at Uranus. There is a, an exact Mars-Uranus conjunction at the time of the solar return. And that Mars-Uranus conjunction is on Algol. In other words, it's not just the solar return for the... It's not just a solar return, it's actually a Mars return as well. So let's just line these charts up to really show you what I mean. So if we put uh, the two in between. So we have sun conjunct sun by definition because it's a solar return. So the sun returns to where it was in 1945 with that first test, it happens on July the 15th, 2024. But Mars also is very close to where it was as well. So the Mars return would have been the day before. And Mars is on Algol. 
And this time round, Mars is conjunct Uranus on Algol. So Mars and Uranus are both hitting um, Mars, the Mars of that first nuclear, first nuclear explosion. And so I'm thinking that this is actually very worrying. Um, I think that over the summer, nuclear issues are going to raise their head. And then I thought, finally, let's look at the converse return. Because it was 79 years ago that America exploded its first nuclear device. So what we can do is we can look at the positions of the planets 79 years before that first nuclear explosion. And so we create a converse solar return. So I'm going to go back all the way back to 1866. This is the position of the planets on July the 16th, 1866. And there we have Mars at 24 degrees, 7 minutes Taurus. Now, because of the precession of the equinoxes, Mars is actually very close to Algol. So what happens is that because of the precession of the equinoxes, the positions of the stars measured by, according to the zodiac, they do sort of keep shifting forward. And so on July the 16th, 1866, uh, let me just show you this. If I look at the, this, this program tells me about the fixed stars and we can get a listing here. And it says, this, remember, this is 1866 chart. Mars conjunct Algol, orb, zero degrees, 12 minutes. So Mars was 12 minutes off Algol. So if we go to um, the actual chart of the first atomic bomb, and we do the same thing, and we list, uh, we do, do a basic listing, and we do the fixed stars, we do the same thing. Mars conjunct Algol. This is for the actual first nuclear explosion. Mars conjunct Algol, orb, 0 degrees, 11 minutes. So in 1866, the orb was 12 minutes. In eight, 1945, the orb was 11 minutes. And finally, if we look at the return for 2024, and check the orb here, uh, we find that the orb is Mars conjunct Algol, 0 degrees, 12 minutes. So Mars is keeping up with Algol. And so if you try to imagine that, you've got the nuclear explosion on July the 16th, 1945. You move 79 years in the future. You move 79 years in the, in, in the past. And in both, both times, both events, 79 before, years before, 79 years after, there's Mars conjunct Algol in both cases. Mars conjunct Algol in the middle, Mars conjunct Algol 79 years in the future, Mars conjunct Algol 79 years in the past, and yet the orb is the same. And because of that, I think we need to be very worried about what is happening over the summer. You know, Russia has just had a tactical nuclear weapons drill. Uh, Ukraine has starting to hit some of Russia's nuclear defense infrastructure. I think there was an early warning system that Russia had that uh, I think that Ukraine managed to send an attackums missile onto. So while Russia is for certain winning its war against Ukraine, Russia's um, um, Ukraine's attacks on Crimea and even in Russia itself are, st are having an, uh, having an impact. And Russia is a nuclear power. What is Russia going to do with its nuclear weapons? Now, that 1945 chart was a test. No one was directly killed. I'm sure people got cancer as a result of that June 16th, 1945 test. It's not the Hiroshima chart I'm looking at. I'm looking at the chart of the first test. So it may be that there is going to be a nuclear explosion over the summer. Maybe it's not going to be something directed 
on people, maybe it's a demonstration, maybe it's an impromptu test, something like that. But I think that from July onwards, I really do think that nuclear matters could raise their heads. So that's why I think I have to give some kind of a nuclear warning. OK, uh, that is enough on nuclear stuff. I, I'm afraid I do find nuclear stuff really fascinating. You know, I just uh, I can't help myself. OK, so uh, I now want to consider the uh, I Ching. And I want to look at this week from the perspective of the I Ching. And this uh, I Ching reading will have four sections. I will have um, a general section. Then I will consider um, money, uh, then career, and then relationships. And just a reminder, if you don't want your I Ching read, you don't have to have it read. My reading only applies to people who are watching the Eaching section. If you're not, don't watch a section, you're not part of a reading. So if you want to stop watching a video, that is fine. Okay, so I asked the question what is the week starting on Monday, May the 27th, going to be like for those watching the Eaching section of this video? And the first hexagram I got was hexagram 44 which is coming to meet now this hexagram doesn't move there are no moving lines and that does indicate that whatever's going on this week there may be a certain feeling of stuckness that things really aren't moving that might be good actually uh, a certain lack of dynamism there perhaps we don't have to worry too much about one thing moving to another now this hexagram 44 stuck locked is not entirely fortunate because if you look if you look at the hexagram you've got six or you've got five unbroken lines and then you've got a broken line at the bottom and that broken line at the bottom indicates something negative moving in. Something is trying to worm its way in. And it represents someone who is very keen to be in contact with, with us, who wants to gain our confidence. And it may be a situation that seems very easy. It may be a person who's sort of happy and smiling and doesn't seem to cause any trouble. And we think, OK, fine. Uh, we bring someone in. And that's the moment the trouble starts because it's a broken line and it starts to sort of insinuate itself. And there is a danger here that we lose control. And it's very difficult to know where things are moving. And we have to consider the nuclear hexagram, the hexagram that underlies this hexagram, because we've got, we've got four unbroken lines in the middle. So the nuclear hexagram is hexagram one, the creative. And that just is talking about the underlying principle of coming to meet. And there is a strong creative force. Now that might be our strong creative force that we think we've got everything sorted out. There is our creativity. And then we find that something is undermining it. Or that strong creative force may be working actually in a negative way. It may be someone else with a strong creative force. You know, they really want something to happen. They're not quite sure what they want to happen. It's all a bit chaotic. And they, they come into our lives and they just cause absolute chaos. So the general message, remembering this is a general section of this I Ching reading, is we need to be very careful about bringing things, bringing new things uh, into our house because we don't know quite what they are you know you see these youtube videos don't you of um, 
a lot of sort of animal sort of exploitation videos. I think they're exploitation in the sense they're just trying to get you to watch them, you know, about, you know, how someone bought this cute kitten into their house. They find a starving kitten and they look after it. And then they find out when it's too late that it's actually a tiger cub and they've got a 10 foot tiger in their house or maybe it's a bear. They thought it was a dog. So you kind of bring some starving thing into your house. Metaphorically, I'm speaking, it seems harmless. And then before you know it, you've got a monster on your hands. So that might be the message of coming to meet. It's not a time to be bringing new things in unless you really, really know what you are doing because otherwise you could get yourself into trouble and uh, really lose control of the situation. Now looking at this hexagram from the perspective of money, big warning here, do not, do not, do not undertake any new financial commitments because you may not know what you're getting yourself into and, you know, you might be told, oh, it's going to be like be this, it's going to cost you this a month, but actually it costs you something else a month. I suppose on a trivial level, you know, you see all these advertisements for um, internet access and they tell you it's going to be really cheap and it looks good. And you, you don't read the small print and then you sign up. And then you realize that actually that was just an introductory offer. And they didn't tell you about, well, certainly in America, they didn't tell you about the tax, the local taxes and the federal cat taxes and all these taxes. And you actually end up paying twice what you think you were, what you thought you were paying. So with money, we have to be, you have to be really careful about committing yourself. And it's not a time for making for spending money where there is some possibility of more money being asked for. Or if you start to give money to someone and you think it's okay, it's on a, on a regular basis maybe, you find yourself having to give more and more money. And so it starts off appearing harmless, something small, but that's just the beginning and it's just going to end up being a real drain on your resources. So be careful about anything to do with, you know, monthly plans, giving people money. Um, just be really careful about making financial commitments. Turning to career, it is perhaps a similar picture. Maybe someone will offer you a job <laughs> or a piece of work and it seems really simple and it seems just too easy. And in fact, it's not easy at all. It turns out to be a real problem. Or if you're involved in a job, if you're working, a new situation might turn up and it doesn't seem to be a big deal you perhaps start to trust someone. Uh, maybe you take the view they can help you. Or, or if you're an employer, uh, be very careful who you employ this week or who you hire. The people you employ or hire this week it could turn out to be a real nightmare, but they don't seem like it. They just seem really harmless. They, you, perhaps you interview them and they seem friendly and the kind of person that's going to do a good job. But they're sort of insinuating their way into, into your world, perhaps into your organization, and they could cause a lot of damage. So do be careful uh, in that light. If you happen to be employing someone or if you happen to be hiring someone, or I suppose I've just, I mean, not just in terms of business, I don't know, even if you, if you want uh, some work done on your house or your hiring someone to do some maintenance or to fix something yeah you have to be careful because once you hire them there may be no end to it so be very careful in your terms of career and business and don't take anything on anything new don't if possible okay sometimes it is necessary but do be careful and uh, you should also you know value your boundaries because with 44 coming to meet 
boundaries can be encroached upon and uh, Yes, once you hire someone, it, it can be difficult to get rid of them. And finally, um, there's relationships. This hexagram, hexagram 44, if you take it literally, is about relationships. And what it literally means is a young girl who is anxious, or a young woman who is anxious to marry, uh, she'll marry very easily and she seems harmless but once you bring her into the household she's a nightmare of course that's looking at things from a sort of chinese confucian perspective um, i think in uh, sort of a more general sense uh, every relationship particularly new relationships have to be treated with great caution because there seem to be people out there who seem harmless um, they want to get to know us um, uh, where's the harm? At least that's what it feels like. But in fact, once you start engaging with someone, once you start involving yourself with someone, that's when the problems start. And one piece of advice with this hexagram is that you've got to consider your independence. Your independence does matter because there is big pressure right now for you to lose your independence. You... you you give someone a chance, you bring someone into your life, seems harmless, but in doing that, you lose a huge amount. And yes, you could lose your independence. And so you've got to put your own independence first. So new relationships should be avoided, I think, at all costs this week. And even if you're involved, already involved, perhaps in a long-standing relationship, um, the other person could uh, take up more time than usual and uh, you might feel that's okay, you give them a bit of space but then they could become a real problem and again your independence could, uh, could suffer. So that's it with the I Ching. Coming to meet is, it's not a great hexagram but it is locked. It's not moving anywhere. And, and that, in a way, might be a blessing. Because if it's not moving anywhere, then I think there's a limit to how much damage it can actually cause. So the overall message for this week, regardless of whether we're talking about career, money, um, relationships or something else, is just be very wary of outside forces. And if something seems harmless, it probably isn't. And you should really focus on your independence because this week, that is what matters. And that's it. I hope you found this reading and this astrological na analysis of some interest. Uh, I'm sort of briefer than usual which is probably a good thing. You're probably quite relieved that I'm ending this video so quickly. And still, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, I'd be grateful if you were to like it. Uh, if you enjoyed this video and you're not subscribed, I'd be really grateful if you were to subscribe. And if you want to buy me a coffee, there is a link in the description. So thank you very much for listening. And I will talk to you again very soon.